Hello everyone and welcome to uh, another video on the Fly From Home channel and uh, today we're looking again at some light aircraft instructional stuff. So it's Kitty here again in case you couldn't guess from the uh, lovely tone of my voice and uh, today I'm going to be showing or demonstrating to you something that if uh, if you are a pilot or if you have any kind of flying experience behind you somebody's probably asked you at some point what happens if the engine stops working? So I usually kind of laugh and say panic and wave my arms in the air uh, and leave it at that if somebody just asks me. But if uh, <laughs> obviously in real life um, we need to be prepared for these kinds of situations. If this were a multi-engined aircraft the situation would be far less dire and we'd obviously uh, just be able to carry on on one engine. In a single engine aircraft then things get pretty serious when you lose that uh, that one engine. So what we have to basically do is, is practice what we're going to do uh, should we, we lose an engine all the time uh, as part of every, every course that we do. Uh, some, a manoeuvre called a PFL, a practice forced landing, is a significant part of it. Um, basically until you, you move on to multi-engine aircraft. So uh, as part of the PPL and as part of the, the CPL and any other um, kind of courses, night ratings and things like that. Um, PFLs are an important part of those and as we look uh, to, to train and to, to get ourselves into the kind of mindset where if the engine would quit on us in real life we wouldn't panic, uh, we would follow a set series of drills and um, attempt to get the aircraft on the ground safely. So as you can see I've already got the aircraft into the air, we are flying over um, just close to the Humber Bridge, you can see the Humber Suspension Bridge down there and over there in the distance somewhere, just about there, we've got Humberside Airport. So we're out for a nice fly around in the uh, lovely conditions we've got today. Wind is uh, relatively light from the from the south. Uh, we've got a few clouds, a few cumulus clouds knocking around about three and a half thousand feet. But other than that and a bit of uh, clear air turbulence caused by um, thermals, coming off the fields. We're, we're in lovely sort of flying conditions today. The visibility is pretty good. And uh, today we're, we're, we're flying out and say our, our very unfriendly instructor in the right hand seat here has decided to pull the engine on us and uh, force us to demonstrate a practice force landing. And that's what I'm going to be talking you through uh, as we go through this. So without further ado, and as part of this, I'm going to be pausing and, and talking you through it. Obviously, in real life, um, I'd kind of be rattling through this moderately quickly. I always tell people, don't rush. Nothing in an aeroplane happens instantly, or almost nothing happens in an aeroplane instantly. So you've always got time to stop and think about what you're doing before you do it. Um, but just for the for the um, sake of the of the video and, and making explaining things a little bit more a uh, little bit more straightforward, I'm going to keep pausing at each stage and talking you through uh, what I'd be doing. Okay, so let's on pause. So we've got the aircraft in a cruise configuration right now. It's uh, just above three and a half thousand feet. We've got 25, 25 sets on the manifold pressure and the RPM. And we've got the fuel flow back to, well, it's about 14 now. I'd usually have it back to about 12 in the real aircraft, but it's, uh, it doesn't quite work like that in the uh, simulator version. Okay, so let's say Mr. Instructor has just said, oh no, your engine's just failed. So the first thing I'm going to do in this situation, the first thing I'd do uh, if I was told to demonstrate a PFL, and the first thing I would do in, in real life as well, is you've got to get the aircraft set to its best glide speed. So these this aircraft's wings generate lift most efficiently at the best lift to drag uh, ratio of the of the wing basically. So that's that's going to be for us 80 knots. So we're going to, to slow the aircraft down. Uh, until it gets to 80 knots. Now, as you can see, we're just under 140, well, about 130 knots at the moment. So we've got a lot of excess speed. So what I always teach people to do is use that extra energy. Energy is, is life in this kind of situation. What, what this entire exercise is, is an energy management exercise. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pitch the aircraft back to lose that speed. And as you can see, we're actually gaining altitude from doing that. There's our 80 knots, and then trim. Trim it in, just like we did with the engine failure in the circuit. We get that 80 knots trimmed in, so as you let go, it stays at that attitude. And as you can see, we, we gained about 
about 400 feet or so just from that slowing down so that 400 feet could be the difference between us making a nice suitable field and stacking it into some trees or a power line or something so it's it could be really important that you use that extra energy while you're slowing yourself down now given that we're, we're up at almost 4,000 feet I do have a little bit of time to work this problem so I'm not going to go straight into selecting a field um, that we're going to be putting the aircraft into the first thing I'd probably do in real life is to go through a gross error check so a gross error check would involve going through all the most common and obvious things that could have stopped the engine so what I'm going to do is just quickly scan right to left through the cockpit and go through all the different things that could possibly have stopped the engine so the first thing I'd go to is the fuel pump the electrical fuel pump now the aircraft is fitted with both a mechanical fuel pump on the back of the engine and a backup electrical fuel pump now normally in flight when we're above a thousand feet the electrical fuel pump stays off just so it doesn't wear out too quickly uh, but it could be that the mechanical fuel pump has failed and that is why our engine has stopped so the first thing I do is click the fuel pump on now if the engine has just failed we've still got reasonable airspeed the prop will be windmilling round so if we restore whatever condition has caused the engine to stop so for example if it's fuel starved if we then restore that the windmilling of the propeller the, uh, the airflow just causing the prop to spin round will more than likely just kick the engine back into life so any of these gross error check items if that was the problem um, it will likely give us our engine back straight away and uh, save us the embarrassment of having to land in a field so this is why you, you'd if you've got time if you've got height to work the problem you'd always go through these things first uh, the next thing i'm going to do is as you can see the fuel flow or the mixture lever is, is all the way back here i'd throw that forward into the the full rich position again it could be that we've just got a lean cut out for whatever reason uh, and it could be putting that forward uh, restores fuel flow into the engine uh, the next thing i'd probably do is come across here and switch fuel tanks um, one of the most embarrassing ways to end up in a field is um, to just forget that you've not had the, to forget to change the fuel tanks and just run out of fuel basically the uh, the arrow and the warrior and all the pa28 family we have one tank in each wing but there's no connection between the two tanks so we basically have to burn one tank and then switch to the other and then switch to the next basically manage the fuel levels to keep them round about the same i usually recommend every 15 minutes um, we do something called a Frieda check and as part of the Frieda check we change the fuel tank so the next item I'd be doing was flicking that over and then I'd be just giving the aircraft a moment just a few seconds to see if any of those actions restore the engine so we're going to do that now so fuel pump full rich change tanks so given that this is a PFL situation we haven't actually lost the engine obviously the engine is is just ticking over its idle at the moment but we'll assume that our actions haven't managed to restore the engine so the next thing I'm going to start doing is I'm going to select a suitable landing site now <clears throat> what I usually describe um, the method that we use for this to students is uh, to look for for the S's I think this is five S's I believe let me think about it yeah five answers <laughs> so we're looking for something that's primarily size so we're looking for something really big the bigger the target is the less likely we're going to miss it the next thing we're going to be looking for is shape we're looking for a field which is has its longest edge into wind now today's wind is well we don't know exactly what today's wind is around here but we know when we took off that the wind was roughly coming from 200 200 around about here so we're looking for something that's orientated roughly north south the next thing we're looking for is surface now ideally we'd be looking for a tarmac surface an old runway an active runway even better to put the aircraft down onto now Humberside as I as I mentioned is is over there I'm in the real world in this kind of situation if we lost the engine I might set the glide up and try and make Humberside from here. It's, it's possible that I could get fairly close, um, at least across the aircraft ba uh, airfield boundary from here, possibly even get it onto the runway from here. Um, however, given that uh, the point of this exercise is to show that I can select a suitable landing site if something like that wasn't available, I'm just going to go for a field. Uh, the next thing I'd be looking for is um, slope. So ideally, I'd be looking for something that's that's uphill definitely don't want to be looking for something that's downhill if we're landing downhill obviously the aircraft is going to um, be harder to stop and given that the surface might possibly be wet or slippery 
or long grass or anything like that. We don't want to be making it any more difficult to stop than we absolutely have to. Um, it also makes it more difficult to, to put the aircraft down in the first place because you have to increase your rate of descent uh, to get the wheels to connect with the ground in the first place. And the final thing I'd be looking for is surrounds. So surroundings, basically you're looking for anything, especially on the final approach track to your field, um, that might possibly get in your way. Now, in the flight simulation world, um, I don't think we have any, but in real life, obviously, we have things like high-tension power lines, telegraph cables, telephone cables, all those kinds of things, uh, masts, towers, chimneys, tall trees, all that kind of stuff. So I'd be looking at the surrounds of the field and making sure none of those sorts of things were going to intersect with our approach path. So having a quick look around on both sides, we've got the city of Hull on our left here. So obviously I don't want to be uh, going into that. Um, previously mentioned, we've got the airfield over there, but there's some good looking fields around about here. Um, and I'm looking at the moment, pr probably at this one here, this lighter colored one with some farm buildings in the corner. Now we're fairly close to that. So I think this will make a good example. So I'm going to try and get us into that field there. So we're going to unpause and immediately turn the aircraft towards that field. Don't be tempted to crank the aeroplane around at high angles of bank. It's a good way to, to put a lot of drag on the aircraft and to increase your rate of descent quite heavily. So we'll level out that. And we'll continue. So, we've selected our field, we've done some gross error checks, we've not been able to get our engine restarted, however, we could, at this point, do a full restart drill. So a full restart drill would involve going through everything uh, that we possibly could in the cockpit to try and troubleshoot and try and get the engine going again. So, given that we've got a little bit of time, we've got our field down just underneath the nose now, we can probably, we've, we've, we've definitely got some time to work through a full restart drill. So it's worth doing. It could possibly save us from, uh, from ending up in that field in the first place. So, again, it's a right to left scan through the cockpit. The fuel pump's already on. The fuel flow is already full forward. Uh, the prop can stay where it is for now. I would cycle the throttle up and down to try and clear any kind of blockage that might be in there. I'd also cycle the fuel flow, actually. Uh, up and down and then back to full rich throttle up and down um, to try and kick it back into life there. I'd go across again to the magneto switch here and I'd try it on every position including off to absolve the possibility of there being any kind of uh, grounding error or, or short on the ignition system of the aircraft. So every position including off because potentially you turn it to off, the engine could spring back to life again. You could suddenly start getting a spark out of some or all of your, of your spark plugs. Fuel flow, uh, correction, the fuel tank selector. Cycle the fuel tank selector. We've already changed it, but just cycle it backwards and forwards. It could remove some kind of fuel blockage that's uh, preventing the, the fuel from getting, getting through. So it's worth cycling that. If none of those um, actions have allowed the engine to, to spring back to life again, then basically we've we've got to accept that we've got a dead engine and that we're making an off airfield landing. So in that sort of situation, um, you can start to think about a few other actions as well. So let's do our full restart. So fuel pump is already on. We'll cycle that on and off. Cycle the mixture up and down. Cycle the throttle. Then we're going to every position, including off and cycle the fuel tank selector. We've got no indication that our engine's going to be restarting. Our instructor has said, no, your engine's not restarted. As we've just run through those touch drills in a practice situation. So we're going to instead move on to our next item. So our next item in real life and uh, in, a, in a simulated situation and in a uh, an actual engine failure would probably be calling a mayday. Now, we always aviate, navigate, communicate. Communicating is the least important of those things. Uh, assuming we were flying around here, we'd be talking to Humberside, we'd have some kind of basic service at least. So if we suddenly disappeared off the scope and we weren't answering the radio anymore, they'd immediately assume that something bad had happened to us and, and get um, 
uh, rescue and recovery out to us. However, um, it's always best to alert people. It could be that um, the, the the time of response of, of that uh, emergency response could be you know, a life-saving thing. So we give ourselves the best possible chance by making a mayday call. Now, any of you you have done um, air law uh, communications, that kind of thing, you and, uh, and uh, got yourself an RT license for, for flying light aircraft, knows that the mayday call takes a specific format and there's a uh, specific order you have to do everything and, and specific information you have to pass across as you do it. However, uh, in a real life situation, I always say, just get out the most important information and concentrate on flying the aircraft. Don't be thinking about, oh, what order does a mayday call go in? What I usually uh, just throw out there, even even on a on a test, you, your examiner isn't looking for a perfect format mayday call, not even on a CPL test. He's just looking for you to fly the airplane and do the actions um, as accurately and as safely as possible. So the sort of mayday call I would probably throw out is something along these sorts of lines. Uh, mayday, 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 Golf, Tango, Echo, Bravo, Zulu. Uh, we are engine failure, just uh, about four miles to the... Um, North Humber side, passing altitude 3,200 feet in 10 force landing, and we've got uh, two on board. So it just puts out the most important information there, just telling them what's wrong with us, where we are, how high we are, and what we intend to do, and also how many people they should be looking for in the potential wreckage of our aeroplane. So I'm just going to pop outside now and see if I can spot our field, given that the eternal struggle with flight sim is always visibility. So let's see if we can spot that uh, nice farmer's field that I selected earlier with the uh, building in the corner. Ah, okay, that's it there. Okay, so it's just to the left of the nose there. And oh, we have actually got some power lines. Okay, so the power lines are across the end of the field. Now, I guess that makes uh, that field a little bit more of a risky prospect then. So we could decide to reselect. So there's a nice looking oblong field there, which kind of looks a little bit like a runway. So I'm going to change my mind and go for that one instead, given that we have some power lines uh, across our original selection. So let's go back inside. Now, I'm 100% confident that we can make that field from our height. So given that piece of information, I'm going to drop the landing gear. Now this is going to significantly increase our rate of descent, but that's fine because at this point, that's exactly what we want. Now if we were a little bit closer, I'd be looking to fly a little bit of a circuit around here. As you can see, I've kind of put myself on a bit of a, uh, a left base leg. I'm also going to start throwing out some flat. That's one stage. That's two stage. Now, our mayday call is done. We've done our flying of the aircraft. Remember, flying of the aircraft is first and foremost. There's a few other little checks that we can get out of the way, basically to secure the aircraft ready for this landing in this field. So, what we're going to do is, again, right to left through the cockpit, we're going to turn everything off. We want to minimize the chance of the aircraft bursting into flames if we rupture the fuel tank or rupture the fuel lines upon impacting the field. So the fuel pump is going to go off. I'd put the landing light on at this point as well. Uh, it just helps to alert anybody on the ground that we're here, increases our conspicuity. It also helps to scare birds away, so it's worth whacking that on. Uh, fuel pump is, is already on, but we'd turn that off. We'd pull the mixture all the way back to idle cutoff. We could also feather the prop. We could pull the prop lever all the way back um, to try to um, stop the prop from windmilling around, which would reduce the amount of drag on the aircraft, which is obviously very useful if we're trying to extend the glide. However, given that uh, I'm pretty confident that we're going to make our target field over here, uh, I'm not going to bother with that. So, plus obviously this is a, a practice scenario, so we can't feather the prop in a practice scenario. Throttle I'd make sure was at idle. I'd turn the mags all the way to off, and I'd turn the fuel to the off position here. Now, once all those actions were completed, I'd also tell any passengers uh, and also action myself. I'd tighten my belt up, make sure it's nice and tight, uh, ready for whatever kind of impact we're going to have. I'd remove any loose items like sunglasses, glasses, uh, my headset, 
all those sorts of things. I'd throw those um, behind me or, or onto the floor underneath my seat to make sure they're not going to fly around the aircraft and make some sort of uh, nasty shrapnel um, if we're, we're going to make some sort of violent landing. And finally, I would also pop open the door. We've only got one door on this aircraft. And if we were to land and bend the fuselage in any kind of way, it might be that um, that would prevent us from opening the door when we're on the ground. And the last thing we want to be is inside a burning wreckage of an aeroplane with a stuck door that we can't get out of. So I'd pop the door open. Also, one last thing as well, before we hit the ground, I turn the, the battery master off as well, once I'd make any kind of radio call. So if, uh, assuming Humberside has acknowledged our mayday, and there's nothing else I want to say on the radio, and obviously landing light is going to go as well, so I might leave it a little bit as we're coming down um, the final approach course to help scare away any birds and notify anybody on the ground, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, once we're, we're happy with that, I turn the master off as well, because again, it's another source of fire. So going to turn around our base leg. I'm pretty confident there. I'm going to go full flap. I think what we're going to have to do here is uh, weave in some S turns to help increase our rate of descent. Keep it as close to best glide as possible. Ah, I think that's, that's probably looking pretty good there, so I'm going to just level her out there on best glide again. Can always do some side slipping. And let's run our committal checks. So everything off along there, apart from the master battery, fuel uh, flow to idle, throttle to idle, uh, feather the prop if we can, or if we need to, turn the fuel off, turn the mags off, make any last radio calls we want to make, and then knock the master battery off. I'm pretty confident we're going to make our field. We'll come down to about uh, 500 feet above elevation just to make absolutely sure that we can make our target fields. And then we're going to go around. Okay, let's go around. Attitude set, flat, positive brake, gear. and flap again. Climbing away clean, fully forward. Exercise complete and hopefully the examiner or instructor is happy with our performance. Okay, so I just realized watching back through the footage that um, I completely neglected to explain uh, what you'd usually do with the alternate air intake uh, lever during an engine out situation uh, in the real world or as part of the, the drills that you do as a PFL. Now, um, the Arrow being a fuel injected aircraft has uh, a panel filter uh, in front of the engine to prevent debris, insects, dirt, you name it, getting into the, um, getting into the cylinders and causing damage in there. Um, but the problem is, in sort of extreme conditions, heavy rain, um, flying through uh, clouds uh, with f freezing conditions and things like that, you can potentially have um, that panel filter fill up with uh, water, fill up with ice, freeze over uh, and block and block the air from getting into the engine and the engine will cut because of that. So the aircraft has a lever in the cockpit, which I have uh, noted there for you. Um, to switch over to an alternate intake, which is the air scoop on the side of the um, the, the nose cowling, uh, to take in completely unfiltered air, so it completely bypasses the filter, comes from a different source, uh, and hopefully if your filter was blocked, you could switch over to that alternate source and get the engine going again, just based on, on sort of raw unfiltered air. Uh, now, given that uh, the scenario I was depicting here was a, a perfectly nice sunny day, it's very unlikely that um, the situation is that the, the air filters become blocked. However, uh, just to uh, to remove it for the avoidance of doubt, you would probably hit the uh, alternate air um, open. You would take the alternate air open, uh, the earliest um, possibility, po probably on the, on the gross error check, but also probably on the on the full restart if you don't do it at the gross error. Um, just to, to, to take it, the possibility of that being the issue out of the equation. Uh, so yeah, apologies on my part there.
Okay, so we've changed locations. We're on the ground now. Uh, we're at Humberside Airport now, the airport that was just uh, off to the uh, south of us when we were practicing the, uh, the PFL. And I'm going to demonstrate uh, one more engine failure drill that we have to complete uh, as pilots as part of the CPL, PPL uh, and all other sort of bits and pieces when we're playing around with single engine aircraft. And that is to simulate a situation whereby we lose the engine in the worst possible place. The worst possible place to lose an engine is just after takeoff. Uh, when we're in the air, when we've got insufficient runway remaining underneath us, how do we deal with that sort of situation? So the way I always uh, teach people to think of it is um, to never ever sort of consider, oh, you know, can I turn back? Can I can I do a 180 and put it back on the runway? Um, chances are, if you try to do that in real life, uh, you would stall the aircraft on the way round. Uh, you'd run out of height on the way round. Uh, either you're going into into the scenery or into the terminal building or something on the airport as you're trying to make it round, or you're going to stall uh, and stave it in as you're going round on that. So I always tell people to consider or to only consider landing sites that are 30 degrees left or right of the runway centre line. So 30 degrees, thankfully we've helpfully got some uh, numbers at every 30 degree interval. So that means anything between about there and about there on the uh, DI here, we, we consider a suitable landing site. So we can sort of visualize that as we're climbing. So in addition to picking your landing sites, obviously the most important thing is setting that glide. Now our airspeed is going to be relatively low, our energy state is going to be relatively low because we're climbing out. Uh, we climb out uh, at 90 knots when the gear is retracted and obviously at 80 when the gear is uh, extended. Now. If the, uh, if the gear's already down, then we're already at our glide speed, so it's very, very important that we immediately pitch down to maintain that 80 knots. If we've got 90, we've got a little bit of excess leeway, but it's only 10 knots worth, and that will ble bleed off very quickly at a nose-high attitude for the climb. So you've got to react very fast to that engine going. Chances are you're not going to have time to do any kind of restart drills, so don't even try to get the engine going again. Just, admit, just accept that it's gone and fly the aircraft to the absolute best of your ability. If you've got time, you can throw a very, very quick mayday, mayday, mayday out. I wouldn't give it past any more information than that. Just mayday, mayday, mayday over whatever frequency you're talking to, which obviously is going to be tower if you're at a, a controlled airfield. Uh, and then if you have a little bit of extra time, try and throw some committal checks in there. Try and get everything turned off, fuel, battery, uh, close all the throttle and the fuel flows off. Get the door cracked open, remove any loose items just to try and make that impact. Um, as safe as you possibly can. So, without further ado, I'm just going to run this and I'm also going to play the part of a annoying instructor who has given me engine failure after takeoff drill to deal with. Now, as with the PFL, we practice these all the time as part of our qualifications, basically so that we can deal with it if we were to encounter this situation in real life. Okay, we're climbing full forwards on the prop and the RPM. Insufficient runway remaining, gear up. Start to accelerate to 90. We definitely have insufficient remaining now. Okay, engine failure. There comes that airspeed coming back. Select a site. Okay, I'm going for that big one there. Gear down. And I'm going to crack all the flap out almost make it back down onto the runway here but it looks like we're going to just overrun slightly okay committal checks everything off crack the door open okay go around attitude set flat positive rate gear Gears up, flap again, and the positive rate still, flap retract, trim for 90, 25, and 25. Okay, so that's how I'd um, deal with that drill in real life. It's also how I deal with uh, the real life situation. It's very important 
if you ever come across that kind of situation for real or as a drill on test or something like that, don't panic. That's the most important thing. Even though we were tight for time in that situation, I still had time um, to consider a landing site. I still had time to do a few committal checks, throw a mayday out there. Uh, as I was saying before, nothing really, there's, there's only a, a few very limited things that happen instantly in an aeroplane. So you've always got time to think about your actions. If you start panicking, uh, then you're going to start doing things that are going to run counter to your mission of getting the aeroplane safely on the ground. Um, if, you, if you can get it down safely in one piece and save the aeroplane, fantastic, but that's a bonus. Your primary objective is to get the aeroplane on the ground uh, with everybody inside uh, still in one piece. So um, anything that uh, if you if you start panicking and, and doing you know throwing your hands around the cockpit, hitting random levers and stuff, that's going to run very uh, very much counter to your goal of of, uh, of keeping everybody on board alive. So it's important that you think through what you do before you do it uh, and stay calm. Uh, the only emergency situation that I was ever in in real life, um, I'd like to think I handled it fairly well. The student who was with me at the time uh, didn't even realise it was an emergency situation until we'd actually got on the ground and I told him um, how much trouble we'd actually been in. Um, so kind of that that's what you kind of want to be aiming for obviously uh, as an instructor um, as a commercial pilot i've uh, had a fair bit of experience uh, but that doesn't mean as ppls as low hour pilots as students you can't be training yourself to that kind of level of preparedness for for these kind of emergencies it's very very important for, for as long as you carry on uh, flying single engine aircraft either for a hobby or for a career or just for training an hour building going towards uh, the airlines it's very important that you keep uh, your level of skill up at that point where um, you're happy with dealing with these situations almost instinctively. You've got the drill off in the back of your mind constantly and you're always asking yourself a question, you know, if I lost the engine here, what would I do? As you're cruising along, you can keep sort of asking yourself that question. As you're climbing out on the takeoff, as you're thinking about your, your after takeoff drills, you can also be thinking, okay, if the engine dropped here, where am I going to put the aircraft? What am I going to do? What actions are gonna, am I going to take? And if you're always thinking about these sorts of things in the back of your mind, then if it ever were to happen to you in for real, um, then you'd be prepared and you'd be able to take those actions and hopefully get everybody on the ground in one piece. So I hope this um, video was of interest. I hope uh, maybe you've learned a little bit. Um, obviously, if you're an instructor uh, or if you're a qualified pilot, maybe you've, you've been taught a little bit differently how to do those bits and pieces. Um, as I've said before in previous videos, this is how I action things um, at my flying school, how I've been taught to do things, how I've been trained to demonstrate it. Um, perhaps uh, where you learned things are different, their operations manual um, outlines different procedures. That's absolutely fine. Uh, I'm just demonstrating how I would do it or how my company uh, would uh, teach students to deal with these sorts of situations. So again, hope you uh, found it interesting and uh, hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.